though, and we'll start with a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you, Father, that we can be here, that we can uh, dig into your word. And I pray that, Father, you would just uh, communicate uh, through me uh, that, I, that uh, we will really be able to understand more about you and more about your will, uh, more about what you want for our lives. Uh, Father, be with those who can't be with us today. Uh, some are, I know some are traveling, uh, Father, and uh, the, for other reasons. Uh, whatever the reason, I just pray that you'll be with them. I pray that you'll keep them safe, and I pray that you'll encourage them. God, thank you so much for your love. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, letter uh, of Romans to uh, from, from Paul. And I just pray that, uh, Father, we'll be able to really uh, grow and mature from uh, studying it this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Romans chapter 7, you know, we were talking about just the law. And I want to go back over part of chapter 7 because I, I think uh, in trying to, uh, in reading chapter 8 and reading chapter 7, uh, there's some other things here that I think we can really learn from this. So I've got a whole lot of material that I'd like to get through today. Um, so I'm going to go fairly quickly. Um, but um, at the same time, you know, I, just because I want to cover this in one block because it makes sense to cover it uh, in one block. It, it'll make sense if we do this whole section together. In verse 1 it says, Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over man only as long as he lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So that if she marries another man, while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. And <coughs> I just want to stop there because I, I think it's important, and I don't think I emphasized this last week, where he says that, you know, we're bound by the law as long as we're alive, but when we die, we're free from that law. And we talked about that last week. But notice here in verse 4, he says, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who raised, who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit to God. And that's very important for us. So it's not just that we died in baptism and we're freed from the law, you know, and, and now have no obligation, but we died so that we could be freed and belong to another and belong to Christ. So when we're baptized, we yes, we die to the law, we're freed from the law, but in being freed, we now belong to Christ. And, and the reason is that we might bear fruit to God. Now that fruit um, can be many different things. Uh, it, it can be, you know, it, it, it obviously it can be helping other people's people to understand Christ and to, to help win people to Christ. Uh, it can be the fruit um, of our of our character, of our own growth. It can be, you know, there's a lot of fruit that it can be, um, but it is the purpose is that when we die to the law, that we're freed up. Um, and we belong now belong to Christ. Let's look down in verse 9. Actually, we'll start up in verse 7. He says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law did not if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment deceived me and through the commandment, put me to death, so that 
The law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. The law produced opportunity for sin. And so the law was good in that it helped us to understand and to know, it helps us to know what God's will is, obviously. It helps us to know how we were created and what we were created for. But Paul says that the law produced the opportunity for sin because without it, we're unaware. And sin then brought death. The law can never overcome sin. It's powerless to do anything. The law is, is it's, it's straightforward. It's cut and dry. It's black and white in that sense. The law is what it is. If the speed limit is 65 and you go 66, then you have broken the law. Now, the police officer might have mercy in the application of the law and not pull you over for 66. Or if he does pull you over and give you a ticket, the judge may have mercy and throw out that ticket and say, I'm not going to charge you anything for that. But the law is in itself very cut and dry. 65 is the speed limit. 65.1, you're breaking the law. And so the law is powerless to overcome sin. Look back in Romans chapter 3. In verse 25. God presented him, being Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And so, Paul earlier stated that, you know, in fact, God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And so even as we look at the Old Testament, in fact, look at Hebrews chapter 9. And starting in verse 23, and I, I would encourage you to go back and read Hebrews, the whole chapter, the whole, the whole book, actually. But um, it says, It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly thing to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter he heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest entered the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as a man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And so, under the old covenant, under the old law, it's not that the sin was actually taken away for. It was atoned, it was, it was, it was put off. It's not that what the high priest did actually was able to forgive sins by sacrificing the blood of animals. But that too was put off to the time of Christ. And so Jesus 
was the ultimate sacrifice, what we need. Sin brought death, and the law was powerless to change that. But Jesus did change that. Look over in Romans chapter 8. Because this, when I read this the other day in my quiet time, I, I, I got, I, I don't know, I just got, I got really excited about this because it struck in my heart um, in a way that, I, in, in, in a new way. And in a way that I, I was just, I was just really excited about it because it made me feel even more of a sense of confidence in Christ. Amen. Not just in my knowledge of what I know Jesus did, but I think in my heart and in my emotion. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Therefore, there is no condemnation, condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in sinful man, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature, that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mi mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. But what really struck me here, like it never had before, was up in verse 3, or actually verse 4, then to verse 3. It says, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in sinful man. Now, when I've read that before, I've always read this and I've always understood this, this whole, what, what Paul's saying here in Romans is as if this is, this is telling me that I shouldn't sin anymore because God has given us ultimate power that we should be able to never sin again. And although... That's what I would like, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that what you would like? Yes. To not sin anymore? Yes. And certainly we are given, we're given the Holy Spirit. So, in essence, I guess, you know, could we not sin anymore? If we were perfect, but we're not perfect. And we understand that we won't reach perfection. But where he says I, he condemned sin in sinful man, Paul is saying that he condemned sin, that he took away sin's power. When you condemn something, you, you sentence it to death. Or you say it's no longer valid, or however you want to, whatever context you want to use that word. But here, Paul is saying, Jesus took away sin. He condemned sin in sinful man. So sin no longer has the power to put us to death. It doesn't mean that we won't sin anymore. It means that the power of sin is gone. Now look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to start in verse 50. Paul says, I declare to you, brothers, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. 
Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the imperishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, and the mortal with, it, with immortality, then the, the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your, your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brother, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This, you know, Paul says, he, he, he quotes here, he says, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law, but that's been taken away because we died to it. When we died, when we were buried with Christ, we, we, we took ourselves out of the law, away from the law. We're no longer bound by the law. And so the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, because without the law, there's what? Lawlessness. I mean, again, I, I, it's, it's self-explanatory. If there's no law, then chaos reigns. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a movie that was out a couple years ago or, or whenever, and I think they're coming out with a remake called Purge. And the basis of the movie is that one night every year, there is no law. You can murder, you can do whatever. You can take revenge out on anybody you want. And so, you know, it's this, that people locking themselves in their houses and, you know, their houses are like incredibly safe. And, you, you know, I mean, but the idea is there's one night of lawlessness. There's one night where you can do anything that you want. And there's no repercussion. Because without law, you can't be arrested. You can't be found guilty. And so the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. The law is what holds us accountable. But we, when we died with Christ, are no longer under the law. We're under grace. And so, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? I know I'm still a sinful man. I know that I can't live perfectly. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So even though I'm a sinful man, even though I sin, I no longer am under that law. So there is no, there is no, in that sense, there is no sting. There is no death. Jesus, when he died, condemned sin in sinful man. Does that make sense? This is a Incredibly powerful because it frees us up to do what? To belong to Him who we were given when we died of the law. And He says, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. There is nothing more frustrating than working at something, working at something, and trying and trying and trying, and still you don't know if it's going to be in vain. And still you don't know if you can reach it, if you can fulfill it, if you can complete it. That to me, as Solomon put it, is... Pointless. It's, it, it, it is vain. When we're trying to do something and we're just not even sure we're, we're accomplishing anything, we're doing anything, are we going to succeed? 
But he says, because you know that your labor and the Lord is not in vain. Why? Because you've worked so hard? Why? Because you've done so much? Why? Because you've sinned so little? No. Because you belong to someone else. You're no longer under the law. You belong to Christ. And Christ condemned sin and sinful man. This changes, for me, it changes. It changes the way I feel. It changes my confidence level. It, it just, it is so inspiring to me. In Romans 8, Verse 1, again, he says, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How many times do we have to walk around feeling condemned because we fall short of the glory of God? That is not what God wants. Does he want us to be serious about our sin? Absolutely. Should we be broken about our sin? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do we need to be repentant of our sin? Absolutely. But if we understand this, I think it changes the way we go about it. It changes the way we think. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Do we really believe that? Because if you do, you walk around with a sense of confidence that is puzzling to those outside of Christ. And that's one of the things that we should have as Christians that tracks other people to our worship, to our fellowship, and to us as ambassadors of Christ. That confidence. But too much of the time, I think Christians really lack this. They don't, we don't get it. We, we miss it. And so that attraction isn't there to us as a, as a, as a congregation, to us as, a, as an individual, to us as a, a family. But there's something that when there's a confidence in Christ, people will be curious. There's something about confidence that's that's at least, at the very least, draws a curiosity. Some people will put it off as an arrogance. Some people will try to explain it away. Some people will just think that you're fooling. But if you believe the word of God, we can have that confidence. There is no con condemnation, con, not con condensation, <laughs> condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death, right? He's saying the same thing over and over again. Why is that? In hopes that we'll get it. In hopes that, 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 that the Christians there in Rome would get it. And now as I read back through, you know, Paul's other letters, it's, it's like, oh, this is, it all, it all is the same. He's saying the same thing over and over again. He's saying it different ways to apply to different situations or to different people. Look at verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do, and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. Again, and so he condemns sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. You see, there was a requirement. There is a requirement that sin be punished. And Jesus 
fulfilled that requirement. So that the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Look back in 1 Corinthians. Look in verse 12. 15, I'm sorry. Just somewhere in there. That's the way they did it. 15, 12? 15, 12, yeah. Somewhere it is written. No. Um, 15, 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now he's addressing obviously a different issue here. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that He raised Christ from the dead. But He did not raise Him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You know, Paul's addressing here the issue of if there is no resurrection. But I think for us today, it's not that we doubt that Jesus was raised. But I think that's, that, that we lack understanding some of God really destroying death and sin in our life. And so we, again, can live and think as if we're under the law. And the truth is, Paul says in 7 and 8, I have to go back and read this, I won't, I won't you know, specifically point out um, verses here. But Paul says that, that when, when the law came, sin sprang to life. This idea of if there's no law, if we're, even people who are outside of Christ, you ever see, you know, like sometimes you, as Christians, uh, we want to, or you hear Christians say, you know, well, there is no joy, there is no happiness, there is no, you know, outside of, uh, outside of Christ. There are people who, who are happy who aren't Christians. Right? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Why? Mostly because they live outside of the law. God's law. They're unaware. At least they live as if they're unaware. And so there's no guilt. There's no condemnation. <coughs> now ultimately there will be a judgment. But there's no guilt to them because they're not thinking that I'm doing what's wrong. And that's why you talk to some people and no matter how much you try to describe and, and, and help them to see, and still they're ready to... to to understand, to grasp God's law, there'll be no guilt, and so there's no reason for them to feel bad. But Paul says, <coughs> well, in verse 9, he says, Once I was alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. What does that mean? Paul is saying that once I was living before there was any law, like before, I guess, even Adam and Eve, because even in the garden there was the one rule. No. Paul's describing here a state that before, apart from law, I, I was alive. But once I understood the commandment, 
Sin sprang to life and I died. So once I understood God's law and what I was supposed to be doing and didn't do that, then sin sprang to life and I died. Because now I feel guilt. Now I know I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. And now I know that there is a judgment that I'll be held accountable for. Before I was oblivious to that. Now put that together with what Paul said in 1 Corinthians this second. Where he says, if we have hope only in this life, we're to be pitied more than all men. And in the same way, I think, as Christians, if we put ourselves under this law, in our minds and live as if we're under the law. What a terrible state. No wonder so many Christians walk around unhappy. And I'm, there's many reasons. I'm not going to overstate and say this is the reason that every Christian is unhappy. That's ridiculous. But no, no wonder a lot of Christians struggle. No wonder a lot of Christians feel this burden because we don't understand. And we live as if we're under the law. And in some cases, for sure, you'll see people in the world being much more joyful than Christians. Because we live as if we're under the law and not under grace. How does, what does this mean? can be the same person, same situation. That person has been baptized is in Christ. But the mind that is, is living under the law will still be controlled by the sinful nature, will still be have a very negative slant on things. Will still be thinking about what they have to do and what they should do. And what they can do without breaking the law. Those who are freed, not just technically, but in their minds and in their hearts, those people will belong to another. And so that mind is set on how can I please Christ? What can I do to serve Christ? Christ, to serve God. Not because I have to, not because I'm obligated to, but because I'm free to do so, and I want to do so, and I, I, that brings joy to my life to be able to do so. And the more I understand this, the more excited I get to share with other people, not just the church, but I'm talking about friends and relatives. You know, I had a great, uh, just a, a great time with my parents this past week. I went there and I was only with them, be able to be with them for a couple hours. But I just got to share my faith. An opportunity arose and I shared my faith. And shared just from the heart how I believe God is in control of things. And you know, for the first time in my life, and maybe this is, I mean, it is to my shame. But for the first time in my life, I said to my mom and dad, if you pray, please pray about this. We're not even at that point where I can necessarily talk about, you know, or challenge them that they need to be praying. And I don't think that's going to be fruitful. But just to put... If you pray at all, pray about this. And I think that communicated a lot to them about my faith. But why? I think a lot of this is really making the difference for me. And I get excited about sharing with other people. I'm going to be with somebody tomorrow that 
I know doesn't have a strong faith, uh, doesn't have a strong, uh, is not inclined to think in terms of, of spiritually a lot, at least the way that we necessarily would. And already on the way down here, I was just thinking about how, how can I really share with him? How can I ask a question to, to engage in conversation just to see where he's at? Because I really don't even know where he's at. And I want to know where he's at. And if there's a way to help, if there's a way to, to encourage. I don't know if he's, if he's been hurt at some time in the past by religion or, or what's going on. But just to even begin to unravel it. And it could take years for God or Christ to really change this person's heart. But man, if I could just be, just, just be this, the, the tiny seed that starts it, that's exciting to me. That's exciting. So, my. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, that's pretty much what I had to share, so uh, we can open it up for comment, uh, questions, uh, thoughts uh, at this point. This stuff really, I, I mean, I've said it several times now, but it but it really does excite me um, for myself and for all of us. And, you know, some, honestly, some of us may be ahead of where I'm at, but... Some of us may be at the same place, some may be behind. It doesn't matter. You know, because if we understand this stuff and we've understood this stuff, then join with me to help sure that, make sure that everyone understands it. You know, if, if we need to learn, then let's learn. But this is, this is great. This is great news. This is, this is good news. Um, thoughts, questions? Comments, Carol? I just think, even beyond where we went today in Romans 8, like starting in verse 9, particularly down in verse 12, talks about we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature, because if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And then it you know, goes on, not be a slave to fear, but a spirit of sonship, and I, it's it's so much about our perspective as we approach things in our life. And I think so much of our lives as Christians is resetting our perspective as we face challenges, as we face situations, as we face relationships, to approach them with a spirit-filled sense, with a sense of faith. And, and it, it is very much an intentional resetting our, of our mindset not to be ruled by the law, but to be ruled by the Spirit. Right. And, you know, you think about Paul's confidence and, and just how confident he was. And I, I guess, you know, maybe I and maybe many of us think that, wow, well, if I could just be as good as Paul, I would be confident as well. That's, we're missing it. It's not about being as good as Paul to be confident. It's about being in Christ mm -hmm. to be confident. His confidence didn't come in his deeds. Mm -hmm. And he says that over and over again, but I think somehow I read that and I can miss it. And I think many of us can miss it. We can be as confident as Paul now with whatever life we have mm -hmm. because we're in Christ, period. Mm -hmm. Martha? Um, I was just, I had written a few notes and uh, Romans we're talking in the sixth chapter here, and I've written it. We are given opportunities to be righteous each day um, through Christ. Um, you know, and people don't, people outside of uh, Christ, they don't understand that. But we have every day is an opportunity. And then over in uh, Galatians, I had written that Paul, he had rebuked the church there because they had seen like they had forgotten the grace that they were given through Christ. And sometimes uh, I feel like people, you know, as, as a Christian, sometimes I forget that. And I feel like all of the, the letters from Paul to the churches uh, were he was encouraged, trying to encourage them to continue in, in that in that gospel, that truth that they were given in the beginning, to continue <coughs> on it, 
and don't just throw it aside. You know, just don't just throw that aside in your life. Don't you know? Don't forget about this wonderful treasure that we've been given. This grace that we've been given. Absolutely, and it's different than anything we can experience anywhere else. You, you, we can't find that, you know, anywhere else. <clears throat> Something came back. Um, when you were talking earlier about people in the world and content and joy and whatnot, that's what caught my attention. Um, I have a lot, I mean, a lot of acquaintances, friends that are Buddhists, these universe people, I don't know, New Age. It's not even Christianity, it's just the universe is God um, mm -hmm. kind of thing. And they are. They are very, actually joyful and content and happy. They're very kind, loving people. They're serving, doing what Christians were known for years ago. Um, and when you said about they aren't, they, they don't know the loss of them or they're you know, breaking, my, my thought was, well, I'm a Gentile. I've never been bound to the law. I didn't even know much about the law until I studied it last year or whatnot. And I still don't feel bound by it either because I'm not a Jew. Um, and so my thought process was beyond that, I, in the New Testament, what I am bound by now is the two commands, to love God with all my heart, soul, strength, and to love my neighbor as myself. Mm -hmm. And um, which the world these days isn't lagging far behind either um, because there are a lot of people out there serving and loving other people um, very well. Um, and so then my question was, like, this whole book is about the law, which we're not bound by. Um, I don't live by guilt. It's not my, I have many sins. That's not one of them, um, to be constantly bogged down by guilt and regret. So then my question is, how does that apply to us now when we are bound, we never were as Gentiles, to this rule um, of the law and the curses? I think, I mean, when Mark was reading, to me even, it, it struck me that this is all about conscience. I'm trying to think of where the verses, I think it's in Hebrews, where it's, it's when we use, you know, someone outside of the law is bound to their conscience. Their law is a law unto itself. I can't remember how the verse goes, but the gist of it is that people who are outside of the law were bound to their conscience. So even while you said, I don't really feel guilty, it's not that you don't have an awareness of going against your conscience. And so, whether you're talking about a child, you know, because that becomes part of this as well, when you become aware with your conscience of disobeying your conscience, then if you want to, you know, take it down to the technical, if you're outside of being a Jew, that would be the answer to it, that it, then your conscience is your guide. I think that's true for, that's what motivates us to go reach out to people around the world. Because, okay, they may have no awareness of the Bible and God's commands, but anyone who has violated their conscience has created their own law and is a lawbreaker. And so the need for forgiveness exists. And I think in that sense, the need for forgiveness exists for everyone. It's not just about Jew versus Gentile, the Old Testament law. It's about a violation of God's law, which is the law that's in our hearts, in a sense, as well. So that's, that's the way I think about that. Um, and, and maybe by nature, you know, some of us are not is given to guilt, feeling guilt. Yeah, that's um, why I said for me it's not. So, yeah. so it's not that this still applies to you. It's just that it might not hit you in the same way that it does for someone who has a very guilty nature, which frees them up. But then our call is somebody who may not naturally feel that guilt is to help the other people to really understand that and get that. As Christians, so that and that's how it applies. Pamela, just listening to everything, I think what's striking me is the fact that, you know, if you come from it from to my point of view of, okay, I'm a Gentile anyway, so I've never been bound by law. But along with what Carol was saying, that you know, as long as we have a conscience, which we all do, and we violated it, we broke, we become lawbreakers, right. whether we recognize the formal law of God or not. I think this idea, though, of being a Christian and living as if we're under the law is a learned behavior. And so at the end of the day, our congregation today, 2014, what are we going to do differently to create that atmosphere of 
they're not free of condemnation, that we're all the same at the foot of the cross, that we um, are free and um, are, are free to have that confidence in grace. And I think that's just kind of where my brain is parked. Like, okay, so, so what do we do differently so that we don't continue to have that mindset of being trapped? How do we encourage one another? How do we see to it that we don't develop a sinful, unbelieving heart that hardens itself against this great news that there is no condemnation. We are free. We can be confident. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that's kind of sitting there like, I don't know. Well, I think I think I think it's a great question. I think first of all, we have to we have to allow ourselves. And we're running over time, but that's okay. We're, we're, we have to allow ourselves to be taught. First of all, we have to recognize the dynamic or the thing, which is is what we're trying to do here. Um, and, and I don't know. I think we can put our heads together and figure that out. I, I don't have all the answers for that. Um, I, I do know that I think. I didn't ask it. Oh, what you don't? That's even what I was thinking too, because I know for me, like even some of the things you read, right? Like, I you, you get confused. It's kind of like I do things I shouldn't do because do, you know, like those kinds of things just confuse me. But the teachings John Churchill spoke on, the teachings you've been teaching on, I think it's really becoming a part of who the congregation is. You know, I think we were so much, at one point, we were all like unified in a way of thinking and a way of doing things. And then, you know, the pendulum kind of just got all mixed a little bit. And I think we've been brought, it seems, at least for me, I feel like we're now in being patient, I think, in allowing God to just work we're getting brought to a place where we're being brought back to how do we make this happen? And God is making it happen. God is bringing us to that point from very varying degrees. You know what I mean? I know, you know, like, I, like me, I sit here and I go, wow, how does Carol come up with these answers so quickly? Like, I get confused when I hear her speak to the question. I'm like, oh, but then I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And hearing you, you know, ask the question, you know, but then again, then it all comes into play, and it makes sense. So, it, I, like, for me, I just feel like we are setting that stage. We are letting God work in our lives. And I think as we talk about it and live it, Communicated. I know from these last lessons, I have had more spiritual conversations with people. I have had women literally crying, hearing about the grace and the not being condemned by the law. Like I had such great conversations with two women this week that were literally them crying because they were at this point in the church and they're looking for this. Amen. And so, I don't know, I think we're getting there. But. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, and I think that's true. I do think that it has, there is, there is a certain aspect of this that's got to soak in. I think a couple of practicals for us is, one, go back and read the entire, mm -hmm. the entirety of Romans mm -hmm. again. As we continue to learn, keep reading it. It will come to life as we begin to study this stuff. Secondly, I think for those who, for those that are beginning to comprehend, I think we live this. We live it through openness. We live it through our lives. We, we infiltrate it into the fellowship, into conversations. Um, you know, I think that we talk about it. We, we talk about it in terms of our evangelism, what we're doing, and our, the fruits of our life, our character. I, I think we have to embody this as we get it. And if we embody it as we get it, then people around, just as I said, other people are attracted to that. Other people, even within our congregation, that will sort of, will find another level, um, you, you know, that, that, that will help one another out with. Um, and so, again, I don't have all the answers. I'm open to ideas, suggestions, thoughts, you know, let's, hey, let's get it rolling.
but I'm confident that this is what we need. Um, and I think the first part of it is, is figuring it out because it is a learned. It is learned. And we've learned it through religion. We've learned it through preaching. But we also learn it through our families. Right? I mean, we can't, even as parents, as much as we love our kids, we can't duplicate the same grace that God gives us. Amen. We try, and we should try the best we can, yeah. but we can't duplicate that. So we even learn it from our families, no matter how awesome our families are. And for some of us, our families, we're not at the highest level, you know? So we, we all come from different backgrounds. So it is a learned thing, and it's something that we have to be retaught and, 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 and really... Um, be able to, to, to grab um, hold of and really get excited about. So we're way over time, but thank you. Um, we'll come back and we'll talk next week. We'll talk some more about what that means for us in our life and how that lives out and, and what it means uh, to us in a practical way. Thanks. Amen.